Thanks to the organizers. Thanks all to all of you for being here. Um, I have put up on my webpage both these slides in case I like you want to go back and look at a previous slide. So if you just go to my webpage right at the top, it's like CRM talk. There's also the paper is not yet on the archive, but it is like so close to being done and will be there in a week or two. The paper is temporarily on my webpage. I will probably take it down tomorrow, but you know, if you want to look at it during the talk, you're also welcome to do that. Um, yeah, so this talk is called Towards a Quantum Exceptional Series. So I'll explain what that means in a minute. Um, this is a paper I've been working on for literally 10 years um, and uh, did not work on it for a couple of years. Then Dylan and I have been furiously finishing in the last couple of months and it is almost done. Um, here's just a brief outline. What do I mean by quantum exceptional? So I'm going to have to tell you there are two words there, quantum and exceptional. And annoyingly, both of those, the opposite of them are classical, right? So you can be quantum or classical, and you can be exceptional group or a classical group. So I'm going to build up to this. I'll tell you what classical classical series are, um, what quantum classical series are, what classical exceptional is, and then quantum exceptional, which is our new goal. And then I'll get to some, some consequences. So to build up to these classical classical series. So GLN is the universal group with a representation of dimension N. That's the point of GLN. And ON is the same thing with a self-dual representation. Okay, I would like it to be symmetrically self-dual. So it's ON and not SPN, but that's not a big deal. Now, I want to try to generalize this. And uh, what's the thing we often do? Well, the category of representations of a group is a symmetric tensor category. So I want to ask the same question for symmetric tensor categories. So I can define these things OT and GLT, where T is not necessarily an integer, which is the symmetric, uh, which is the goal here is to define something that's the universal symmetric tensor category with an object of dimension T or a universal symmetric tensor category with a symmetrically self-dual object of dimension T. And you can define that diagrammatically uh, as just the symmetric tensor category whose objects are, you know, sort of points on a, oh, I have this fancy, you can't laser point on there, but I can laser point on here. Um, this is a map from two dots to four dots. Uh, and uh, I can look at linear combinations of such things. I compose by vertically stacking. I tensor by putting things next to each other. Uh, but if I ever see a circle, I can remove it and multiply by T. So that means it's a, symmetric tensor category with a self-dual object, which is the line. It's actually symmetrically self-dual and has dimension T. So this is a natural generalization of ON. Um, and you can do the same thing with oriented strands, and then it'll just be a not self-dual representation of dimension T. Yeah. What is symmetrically self-dual? So, yeah. So in a symmetric tensor category, you can say it's Frobenius. Well, in all cases, it means Frobenius prone indicator uh, one and not minus one. And you, in a symmetric tensor category, you probably know what that means. In a pivotal tensor category, you can also figure it out what it, what it means. Superscript? Uh, the superscript just says diagram. So um, there will be some warnings on the next page or different things that people call OT. This is the diagram version as opposed to the abelian version. So that just says diagram. Okay. So two warnings. First, and you can tell that I wrote in the diagrams afterwards, which is why they don't fit nicely between the GL and the N. Um, I motivated these diagram GLTs as a generalization of GLN, but they're not quite a generalization of GLN. There is a map in the diagram version of GLN to ref GLN, but it's not an equivalence because in ref GLN, the N plus first wedge power is zero. And in my diagram category, I didn't put in anything to assure that. OK, so they're slightly different. This shouldn't be surprising because if you think about supergroups, there's GLN plus KK. This also has a an object of dimension N plus K minus K, which is N. So uh, so can't, you know, uh, yes. Yeah, so that means this sort of has to be big enough that it also has maps to all of these things. Um, and if N is in Z, and this was Theo's question, there's also the abelian version of GLN, which is a bit more complicated. Uh, one of the ways of defining it due to these people uh, is as a, some kind of inverse limit of these supergroups. OK, so it, the, the, the way this GLT that I defined works is for generic T, 
it actually, if you item to complete it, you'll get something semi-simple. When T is N, things become much more complicated and you might get it to the Sibelian version or not. Okay, does that make sense? Um, so then that's classical, classical, and that's classical. Now we're gonna get to quantum classical. So what happens if I try to quantize those? We know that I can start with a rep ON and quantize it to get some sort of ONQ. Now, let me give you a little warning here. When I write ONQ, what I mean is the quantum tensor category that deforms the category of representations of the group ON, not the Lie algebra ON. So if I meant all representations of the Lie algebra, I would write spin. So this differs from spin in two ways. First, it's only the vector representations. It's only the representations whose highest weight is, uh, is a root. Um, and secondly, if you wanted to define it in terms of the category of representations of the uh, quantized enveloping algebra, you would have to put, that would give you like SO, even if I restricted to the vector representation. So I have to do some sort of equivariantization by a Z mod two to get the right thing. Okay. Um, great. So we have these uh, quantizations that we could do. And we wanna know, can we do the same thing for OT and GLT? Well, what would that give you? There would now be two parameters. You would get some braided tensor category of two parameters. And so recipe and triad would give you a two parameter not polynomial. We expect two of them. We know two of them. So presumably, this is just telling you how I'm playing Kalpman. And in fact, that's true. You can check that at the correct values of the parameter, uh, Kalpman and, uh, and Homfly agree with glnq and onq okay so uh Homfly is gln and kaufman or bmw is on any questions about that all right so um that is to say i can define a category bmw az i'm going to put in a sign here just so that i can see the theorem in a moment the ribbon category of sums of unoriented tangles now they're ribbon tangles but like they you can have crossings that are not symmetric now uh, modulo these two relations these are just the defining relations of the Kalman polynomial um, and otq is just this bmw with the minus sign why should it be the minus sign was q goes to one it should become symmetric and that is sort of well behaved for this relation with the minus sign so that the crossing is becoming close to being equal to the other crossing as z becomes small so you take BMW with the minus sign, and if you might make the right change of variables, here I've written Q long. Uh, there's an annoying thing in de defining quantum groups that there's like the commutation or variable uh, relations involve the power of some Q, and like the power is different depending upon whether you're a short root or a long root. I want the power, what I like Q long, I mean the power of Q that you would assign to a long root, which is maybe Q or maybe not Q, you know, depending on your conventions, it's like Q or Q squared. Okay, now, just like before, there are these issues when T was an integer, and now we have issues when T is an integer or when Q is a root of unity. Both of those cause funny things to happen that I don't want to get into. Okay. Um, now, why did I want to write this definition down? Because I want to know how you would guess this if someone hadn't told you already about the Kalfman polynomial. And Kalfman doesn't say this is how he guessed it, but surely it is. Um, I mean, he didn't have this language but the argument is is kind of the same argument so what i want to say is if c is any ribbon category x is simple and x tensor x breaks up as one plus a plus b where all three of those are simple and distinct so a shouldn't be b a shouldn't be one okay um and this fact that one appears tells you that x is self-dual i'm just going to assume that it's symmetrically self-dual that has Frobenius share indicator one um then there's some values of a and z and a functor from bmw to c i probably shouldn't have written this whatever i meant by surjective here uh maybe if i require x to be a tensor generator or something then i know it describes the whole category okay um and moreover you can read off the variables by knowing the eigenvalue of the crossing 
So the crossing acts on four boundary point diagrams. If I have a four boundary point diagram and I put a crossing, I get another four boundary point diagram. Because x squared breaks up as a sum of three things, that's a three-dimensional space. And the eigenvalues are a lambda and lambda inverse. And the z variable that you had before is this lambda plus lambda inverse. Okay. So you can read off the variables from the eigenvalues. This is, comes from a very old paper of mine with Emily and Scott. Um, but I, everyone must have known it before but that, that we just wrote down the right statement. Okay. And the proof of this is not hard. There must be some relation between these four diagrams because they live in a three dimensional space. Rotation acts on the space of relations. If I have a valid relation and I rotate, it's still going to be a valid relation. So I must have a relation that's a rotational eigenvector. Uh, you might have thought that I could have fourth roots of unity, but in fact, all those pictures happen to come back to themselves under 180 degree rotation. So it's a representation of Z mod two. It either has eigenvalue one or eigenvalue minus one. So you get a relation of this form. Um, if A is zero, you can show that V squared would be one, which contradicts our assumption. So dividing through by whatever A is, I can assume that A is one and B is some variable Z, and that was the Z in my relation. Okay, so you could just read off these, these relations, and the eigenvalues are just a calculation. Again, this is in uh, an old paper of, of ours called, uh, uh, it has coincidences in the name. It's like quantum group coincidences and one thing like that. Okay. Any questions about that? So, yeah. Can, can you very briefly yeah. say, say what what we know about the whole category? So is one A and B the only simple objects, or is it a zoo of objects? There's a ton of other objects. Yeah, yeah. So you should. I mean, what these will be is deformations of ON. So in terms of the simple objects, it looks just like representations of the orthogonal groups. So there's like there's one of them, you know, for every dominant weight for ON. So there, there's really a lot of them. It's only X squared that has very few of them. So this is just a fact. If you look at the defining representation of an or, of any orthogonal group, its tensor square will break up that way. I guess the first few are accessions, but yeah. Uh, symmetric implies, oh yes. I think I said ribbon somewhere. But yeah, everything in sight will be ribbon. Uh, in the symmetric case, I don't have to worry about it because symmetric implies pivotal, but in the braided case, I'll always be assuming Raven in this talk. Yeah. So we've knocked off the first two things, classical, classical, quantum, classical. Now we're going to do Deline's classical exceptional series. Okay. Now, unlike the, everything else I told you so far is real mathematics with proofs. Now we're headed into conjecture territory. Um, so it's like this conjectural construction well, there, there's this conjectural idea due to Deleen that maybe the exceptional Lie groups fit into a family the same way that the classical groups did. Okay. So is there a symmetric tensor category interpolating between the exceptional Lie groups? So for example, you might ask, is there a family of symmetric tensor categories so that each one has a Lie algebra object in it? And so that it's special values it has functors to the uh, thumb symmetric tensor category of representations of that Lie algebra sending the object to the adjunct mm -hmm. representation. So that's the question. Now, you can make it a bit more precise, which was done by Bogel and others. Uh, there's a, a whole big story here. But the key point is that if I look at the adjoint representation of a exceptional Lie algebra, and I'm a bit careful, so you, there's a caveat, which I'll tell you more about in a little bit, then it always breaks up as one plus itself. You know itself has to be there because that's the bracket map, is the map from G cross G to G. So for example, this is automatically inside wedge squared. Another factor inside wedge squared, and then two factors inside sim squared. That's how you know the adjoint representation of E8 or F4 or E7 works. Uh, some of the other ones like E6 are a little bit trickier, and I'll come back to that in a little bit. But uh, the bracket is some map from G tensor G to G. So I can talk about a trivalent vertex, um, which may be familiar if some of you went to Emily's talks last week. Um, and the existence of the killing form says that G is symmetrically self-dual, so I can use unoriented diagrams. Um, 
And uh, so I, I'm going to try to define something which I'm going to call E8 lambda. This is the exceptional series, and lambda is the parameter. Okay. Are we still in the land of conjecture, or is this something that exists? Uh, well, I'm going to write down a definition, and then I'm going to make some conjectures about it behaving the way we wanted on the previous slide. Okay. So I'm going to look at trivalent symmetric ribbon tangles. So I, I can have trivalent vertices, and then I can connect them up. And everything should be made of ribbons. And so you have to be a little careful about what that means with the trivalent vertex. The important thing is if I take a trivalent vertex and I cross the two ends, I might pick up a factor. Like the, the, tri, the trivalent vert vertices themselves are sort of ribbony. They're, they're three ribbons coming together and not three things coming together. OK, modulo. The circle is given by some number, which has some weird formula in terms of the parameters. So the, there's many ways of parameterizing this, and this lambda one is particularly nice for certain reasons, but uh, they're they're not. There are other ones that are just about as nice. One thing that's nice about this lambda is that there's there's some weird symmetry here, and using this variable, the weird symmetry sends lambda to one minus lambda, which is more convenient than other formulas. But yeah, um, is it important that you have poles in lambda? Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. So, right. So almost everything that I do will sort of only make sense generically. You'll have to avoid a few things. But yes, yeah, certainly I'm the definition that I'm going to be giving does not make sense when lambda is zero or lambda is one. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Okay. So the circle is given by some constant, which has some weird formula in terms of the parameter. You could just use this as your parameter. It's just not as well behaved as lambda. Um, the bygone should be some multiple of the strand. Um, you can always just rescale the trivalent vertex to change that constant. Uh, so you could make it one for stupid reasons. We're going to make it 12 instead of one, but that's not important. Okay. Uh, the lollipop should be zero. Why, why, where do these things come from? This relation comes from the fact that G was supposed to be simple as a representation of G. So if G is simple, then by Schur's lemma, there should only be one map from G to G. So the bygone should be some multiple of the scalar. This is a map from G to the trivial, which since G is simple and the trivial is simple and they're different from each other, there are no such things. So that should be zero. I have tried to, and I'm sure I've messed it up somewhere, write diagrams in blue and numbers and equalities and sums and stuff in black. So you can tell this is the number zero and not the circle okay uh similarly because there's only one map from g squared to g there should be some coefficient here it will turn out that it has to be this b over two that is at six this is anti-symmetry this is that the killing form is symmetric and this is the jacobi relation okay and this weird b over two comes from looking at the jacobi relation if i put a trivalent vertex at the top of the jacobi relate or maybe at the bottom is better put a trivalent vertex here and simplify it, I will force one of those will involve a triangle and it will force that coefficient to be B over two. Doesn't that very last picture there have four valent vertex? No, that's a cross. That's a cross. Yeah. Yeah. This is the Jacobi relation. If I turn the left strand down, it would look like bracket three things in two different ways, right? This term is bracket three things in one way, this term is bracket three things in another way, and this one is bracket three things, but you have to switch the order somewhere. And so this, if you write it out, it's literally just the Jacobi relation, okay? So far, this is stuff that would happen for any simple Lie algebra, okay? If I had any simple Lie algebra, it's adjoint satisfies all of these. I have to tell you a special thing about the exceptional family. And the special thing about the exceptional family was realized independently by Vitanovich. I don't know how you do a CV and, and Vogel. Uh, and uh, you, the timing is right. Like, uh, Vitanovich has this uh, interesting book called Bird Tracks that like no one read, but actually has a bunch of stuff in it. And then like, 15 years later, people are like, oh, all this stuff that we were thinking about is, is in this weird book. And, and he, I, I recommend it. It's free online. It's a, it's a wonderful book. Uh, great. So it's some relation between four point boundary point diagrams. Where does it come from? Well, it's remember before we looked at like rotationally symmetric relations. Here I actually have a whole action of S4 because I'm looking at a symmetric category. And you can see by looking at like that, 
how many copies were in the wedge squared and how many were in the sim squared, that there has to be some relation among the fully symmetric things. This is sort of obviously fully symmetric. If I put a crossing on that one, anywhere it comes back to itself. If I move this two over to the other side, that sum of three diagrams is also invariant under the symmetric group. You have to use the Jacobi relation. It's kind of not obvious that it is, but it, it works out. So this is sort of, so up to the fact that we normalize this in a particular way, this is just the most general S4 invariant relation you could write down. And so there's no choice here. As soon as you know the tensor product breaks up the way that it did, you're going to have to have this uh, equation for the correctly uh, chosen lambda. Okay, so so this was a definition. Take trivalent symmetric grid entangles modulo all of these relations plus this new one. So sometimes people call these ones like Jacobi diagrams. So something mod these relations would be Jacobi diagrams, and it's Jacobi diagrams plus the Bogel exceptional relation. Okay, now we get to the conjectures. The conjectures are that they, that I just wrote down for you a well-behaved category, okay? Now this has two hacks to it. One is that I wrote down enough relations that you can simplify closed diagrams. So the first conjecture is if I write any complicated Jacobi, relation, uh, Jacobi diagram, any big trivalent uh, yeah, here I said, yeah, oh, right, symmetric ribbon. Okay, good. I didn't lie. All right. So, uh, yeah, so take any giant diagram of trivalent things and crossings. I want to rewrite those into a, there should be a finite set for each number of boundary points, and I want to rewrite it as a sum of that finite basis. In particular, if I look at closed diagrams, I would like to be able to turn them all into numbers. Okay, so uh, so the claim is all the Hom spaces are finite dimensional, and for the first few Hom spaces, so by that I mean zero boundary point, one boundary point, two boundary point, three boundary point, and four boundary point, I would like the obvious bases to be the right bases, that is to say the empty diagram, zero, it's a zero dimensional vector space, the strand, the trivalent vertex, and these diagrams for the for the four dimensional for the four box space okay that's sufficiency that is open we don't know if it's true there does not seem to there's not an easy like there's not a way to do it that's like purely downhill you can't just say like oh every time i see a square use this and then just keep going uh you might have to use this one backwards and so it's a little unclear uh but we don't dylan's uh, well, I shouldn't say what Dylan believes because he's he he should get to. But I don't know. This, this one is Dylan has a preprint where he looked at some other families where it was not obvious that you could simplify these things and you could do it surprisingly far out. And so this one is maybe not so crazy. And if you told me tomorrow that like you came up with a proof of this, I would believe it. It's like beyond our scheme theory techniques, but it's not like so far beyond our screen scheme theory techniques to be unreasonable, okay? The bad one is this other one, consistency, which says that this category is not the zero category. That one tells you that if I took a giant diagram and I simplified it in two different ways using these rules, I would get the same number out at the end. Um, this is extremely difficult and I, I have no idea how you'd even like begin to prove this one, okay? These are the two conjectures. This sort of makes precise Deleen's conjecture on uh, the existence of this, of this family. Okay. Questions? This is the end of the background. We're about to get to the new stuff. At exactly halfway through the talk. That's remarkable. Okay. Ah, uh, no, 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 because I have one slide. Okay. Um, for special lambda, so if lambda happens to be one of the special values in this chart, then this category has a functor to a quantum group category. Um, uh, I'm missing a Q. Uh, oh, no, 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 because I haven't gotten to the Q yet. Hmm, this was right. Great. Okay. For special lambda, it has a quotient map to some actual existing category rep G for some group G. And so in particular, consistency has to be true, because if I could evaluate some closed diagram in two ways, I would get two different answers inside this group category. And uh, so 
uh, great. All right. Um, for special lambda hazardous quotient, basically the idea of the proof of this is already in Cooperberg Spider paper, but it has sort of been improved by adding off Neshviyab. And I should mention uh, there's this graduate student uh, Canadian, uh, in Canada with uh, Alistair Savage uh, Musayed, who's done some interesting recent work related to a bunch of the stuff related to our paper. So I, you know, since uh, since there's a graduate student that has done good work on this, I wanted to make sure that I mentioned him um, has a result related to this as well. So, um, right, so it says, so here is the interesting caveat that I wanted to tell you about earlier. It's not reps, the, the, the tensor category that you're supposed to look at G as a Lie algebra object in is not the category of representations of the Lie algebra G. It's the category of representations of the Lie algebra automorphisms of G. So there's a group of Lie algebra automorphisms of G and that's the thing that you're supposed to look at. The very good reason for this, which you'll understand if you read the setting up Neshviyev paper, um, and um, that's the one that you want to look at, and that will always look like the adjoint form of the group, semi-direct product, the data diagram automorphisms. So in particular, if you look at E6 or D4, especially D4, the category is a little different from what you would think okay and so remember when i said like g squared breaks up in that certain way i looked at how g squared broke up for like d4 i think it doesn't actually look like that but if you break it up into simples for as representations of this group with a semi-direct product in it some of the simples glom together and then it looks right okay um and uh this parameter lambda actually has a very good explanation it's minus the coxeter, the dual coxeter number over six. The reason that six is there is because of the weird 12 that I chose before. But basically, it's just, and the, the reason that's a six and not a 12 is that the definition of the dual coxeter number is weird and should have a two in it. So basically, up to conventions, it should just be the dual coxeter number. Um, okay. Any questions on this table? So this is what I mean by when I say it goes through all of the exceptional. Okay, and uh, yes, uh, by by this definition, SL three and SL two are are exceptional. But, you know, how could you tell? They're so small. They're everything. All right. Okay. So now, now we get to the problem that I want to talk about. It's not me. It's whether you can quantize these conjectures. All right. So, um, all right, we got one Swifty in the audience. All right. Let's see. So, uh, can I quantize these conjectures? Uh, so what do I need? I need, so first I'm going to replace symmetric trivalent tangles with just trivalent ribbon tangles. No, that part's easy. The hard thing is how do I replace all of these relations? And I want to emphasize, you might think, oh, all I have to do is replace this Rogel square relation. But that's not true. I have to replace the Jacobi relation with something that looks like a Jacobi relation. And I have to replace the fact that crossings were symmetric with a relation that's as useful as crossings are symmetric. So before I had overcrossing is equal to undercrossing. Now I'm going to have some relation like that, possibly with lower order terms. So I need three relations like this, plus some easy stuff that won't be a big deal. Okay. How am I going to get that? Well, I'm going to prove a theorem. I'm going to prove a theorem that says if I have a ribbon category with certain assumptions, all of these relations have to hold, and so I have no choice of what definition to make. That's what I've done at every step so far. So let's assume dimension of, uh, let's assume the invariant space of dimension of Hobbs from X to the N to 1 look like 1, 0, 1, that's the strand, 1, that's the trivalent vertex, and then 5, that's the G squared broke up as a sum of five terms. Okay, so if you went to Emily's talk last week, I can tell you where this whole project started, which is in Emily's talk, she talked about uh, this trivalent paper that, that we wrote, where it goes 10114. And so we're like, oh, let's try 10115. Scott had some computer program that was doing it. It came up, it came up with some interesting, we couldn't quite get a real classification, but it indicated some interesting example. So I went to talk to Dylan about it, um, and uh, and he was like, "Oh, if you assume braided, I can like prove these anyway." So so from there we went in a different direction. It kind of left this trivalent project, 
uh, and uh, and went here. Okay, so this is our assumption. Is everyone okay with the assumption? So you get a bunch of relations easily. The circle has to be some scalar. I'm going to assume that scalar is not zero, just to make my life nicer. Uh, the twist has to be some scalar. The trivalent twist has to be some other scalar. An easy argument with rotating trivalent vertices around in different ways will show you that this scalar is the square of that scalar. I'm going to put a minus sign here just because I like my relations to look like deformations of the classical one. And in the classical case, oh no, that's back. Oh yeah, in the classical case, this was anti-symmetric. So that's why there's a minus sign there. Uh, this is zero for the same reason. This has some B. I can again normalize away the B to whatever I want. This is some number T. I might not know what T is yet. I need to know what my quantum Jacobi relation is before I can go back and work out that T. I have a quick question. Yes. So it seems, is there supposed to be a, go back to the slide you're just yes. on. Yeah. So with the, with the twist, there should, it should be a trivalent, minus U times a trivalent vertex. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yep. Thanks. Cool. Good Thank catch. You. Great. Thanks. Other questions about this slide? So those are the easy relations. Now get to the hard ones. Now the hard ones always involve looking at the right kind of symmetry. And so this was how Dylan got things started back in summer of 2013. Dylan was my postdoc advisor. Did I tell this story at the beginning? Anyway, I, Dylan was my postdoc advisor. I talked to him every week. I would come in with all of my questions and, the, and uh, it was great. He could talk to me about any kind of math, but then we, we never wrote a paper together. And so now it's been, you know, I finished my postdoc with him in 2012. So anyway, it's very exciting to finally finally be finishing a paper together. But uh, so this was sort of when we came to the, when I asked Dylan, like, what's going on with this weird family? This was what he came up with, which is that the right symmetry to look. So the way Dylan explains this is like, you imagine your crossing is like part of a tetrahedron, and then you start applying tetrahedral symmetry to it. So, you, uh, so in particular, there's a tetrahedral symmetry that is like rotating around a vertex. And so you imagine what that does, it will twist up your ribbons. So you have to remember to correct by some ribbon twisting factors. But what I wanna do is, is do that twist around a, a vertex. And what it looks like is this operation. Given some diagram with four boundary points, I want to rotate three of them while leaving the fourth one fixed, okay? So is everyone okay with that operation? And then I'm going to ask, I'm going to look at my space of relations. I'm going to break it up for, uh, into eigenvectors for this action, okay? And you can look and see that under this action, this one, right? It's like, the you can think of this as like cross and rotate. So like if I cross and then rotate, it'll become this diagram. And, but I will have picked up a twist factor coming from that crossing. And then this one, if I cross and rotate, will just become this one. And that one, if I cross and rotate, the amazing thing is the crossings cancel out. Like that's why this is the really good symmetry. And you just come back to here, but you've picked up a factor of u to the minus second as you went around, okay? And similarly for these three diagrams, so did you use Jacobi for those ones? Um, but, uh, Right, you have to use Jacobi. If I cross and rotate, that one's easy. Here I cross and rotate. Oh yeah, you have to be a little careful to get those relations, but but they, they work. Uh, okay, so you get these, you get, so those six diagrams live in a five-dimensional space. There has to be some relation for them, but the relation you can assume without lots of generality is an eigenvalue for the action of this operation. And moreover, because of how these factors work, uh, there's some relationship between that eigenvalue and U. And the simplest way to, to, you have to do a little bit of a calculation that's in the paper, but uh, to see, we've made some weird normalization choices, but the point is that because you have six of these and you can assume that your relation is an eigenvalue for this action, you get some relation of this form. Uh, we need some weird conventions that you might wonder where they came from and they're just to make like the formula look nice when you think of it as quantizing or ordinary Jacobi, yeah. So this, uh, this symmetry, it looks a lot like this Conway's rope thing. 
Oh, um, it, it looks like you're doing S and then T or something. Yeah, so I mean, it's, I wonder. Yeah, it, it's out of no, the field, uh, but yeah, I mean, somehow it's the well-behaved thing to do on four crossing tangles that won't. Yeah, so I, yeah. Slightly confused. How this is going to? How can you be a, an interesting number? It seems like you're writing down symmetries under, like maybe the double cover of a four. That, like, just the sort of spin, you know, just the sort of spin group of the tetrahedron well let's see so you be interested i mean it's 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 a it's it's a projective yeah. representation and not a representation and you is like measuring the projectiveness of the representation um or oh no maybe uh, it's just the U is just because yeah. i get some twists on yeah exactly numbers. exactly you pick up the U is just coming in from the fact that when i do this uh to one of these diagrams i i picked up a twist here so when I go the whole way around, I picked up a twist, and and okay. so my my eigenvector is going to be some cube root of that twist. Okay. My eigenvalue is going to be some cube root of this twist. Okay. Other questions? People who collaborate with me know that I can never keep track eigenvector and eigenvalue, and it's a, okay. So we have to have some relation of this form, and the only important thing for you to know about this is that it looks like a deformation of Jacobi. Okay. Now I want to make one weird point. This is only the right deformation of Jacobi for exceptional Lie groups. You might have, you might ask like, oh, if I had an arbitrary, like, you know, I can talk about Jacobi for any Lie group. Um, and I'm not claiming that the quantization of any Lie group will have a relation like this, only the exceptional one. Okay. And then here's the miracle. As long as the parameters are generic, I can get all the other relations I want from this one. So as long as the parameters are generic, and the important thing about generic is that V is not at 10th or 12th root of unity. Um, those are the really important facts. Uh, this implies more relations. So if I take the relation and multiply by an H on the bottom, so I put an H everywhere on the bottom and simplify, I'll get a square and a bunch of other stuff that I saw. And then I want to symmetrize it under the symmetry. So there's a missing word here. This is a new symmetry. So you have to know what happens to the square under doing that threefold operation. But if you work it all out and correctly symmetrize under that, you will get a relation that just tells you that the square is equal to some sum of terms over here. Um, and then if you take this relation and just take it minus its rotation, the squares cancel and you get a relation that says overcrossing is undercrossing with lower order terms. So as long as V is generic, the, the, the reason V is generic comes in is that when I do this, actually I should get some coefficient on the square that's some weird function of V and D. And uh, if that number isn't zero, I can't divide by it and get a relation of the form that I want. So you have to be careful in the non-generic cases, but as long as it's generic, the one quantum Jacobi relation implies both the square relation and the crossing relation. So now I have my definition. I have two parameters. Uh, we make a nice change of variables to make it look more like a quantum version of the of the uh, original thing. So we have some variable v. We have some variable w that you're supposed to think of as v to the lambda, where lambda was my old parameter for the classical exceptional thing. These come up in a very nice way, just like for Kaufman, I could read off the parameters from the eigenvalues. I can read off these parameters very nicely from the eigenvalues on this five-dimensional space. And I'm going to define the quantum exceptional series for V and W as trivalent ribbon graphs modulo all the relations I just put on the previous. And the point is that this looks just as good as the classical one. There's just some lower order terms that you have to worry about. Okay. So for example, Great. So now I can state the conjectures. Quantum sufficiency for V and W generic, the Hahn spaces should be finite dimensional and spanned by the, the obvious basis. Probably if you could prove the classical, the classical sufficiency, you could prove this one as well. You just have to throw in an extra step where you like fix your crossings to make the rest of the argument work. Um, quantum consistency that it doesn't give you the zero category. Okay, that's a little hard. Um, and quantum special relation, and again, this is something we can prove, it's not a theorem, 
for the lambdas on that chart that I gave before, it should have the quantum version of that associated group as a quotient, and here's explicitly which values of Q to take. Okay? Um, great. Any questions about those before I talk about this little box here? All right. So um, you might have thought that this is like more general than the classical one. Actually, the implications go like not the directions you might have thought. So the classical one actually implies the quantum one, not generically, but in a formal neighborhood uh, by using a Kinsevich integral argument. Sorry. This is for both the sufficiency, both for sufficiency and consistency. Oh, right. So no, we make a precise statement in the in the paper. The precise statement is is not something that is exactly either of those, but would be implied by having both of them. So there is a statement that yeah. So basically, I want to say knowing both of these for the classical one would imply the quantum one. Uh, but you have to be slightly more careful. Uh, because, for example, I need to make a statement that works over arbitrary rings and not just the complex numbers. So I, I have to be a little bit careful. But morally, what you should think is that classical implies quantum in a formal neighborhood by a Kinsevich integral argument. Weirdly enough, quantum might not imply classical because it's only supposed to be true generically. And the classical case corresponds to V is one. That's a special V. It's not generic. So it might actually be true that the quantum one is true without the classical one being true. And there's even maybe some reason to think this. So there's a similar family, which I won't be able to talk about, which is called the F4 family. And it's like what I did for exceptional things with the adjoint representation, but you instead look at the defining representation of F4 and go through the same nonsense. For that one, we know it's inconsistent in general. But if you quantize that one, you actually get our same quantum family. So we, so if the if the classical exceptional existed and the quantum exceptional existed, you would get that the F, something weird happened as you degenerated to the F four series. So it stands to reason that something weird might happen as you degenerate to the classical series as well. Um, there's kind of some reason to not believe the classical conjectures. So it's sort of nice that. The quantum one might even be true without the classical one. I mean, that that's sort of like, yeah, that's like the chaos point of view is, is what if the quantum one was true without the classical, but yeah. Okay. Um, great. That's the, so that's, that's the main stuff that's in the paper is this theorem that says if you have a ribbon tensor category satisfying certain natural conditions, and some genericness of some parameters, which we make completely precise in the paper, you have to satisfy these three relations. And then a nice statement of the conjectures that are the quantum version of, of, uh, of the classical conjectures. Um, so I wanna end by talking a little bit about some consequences of this. So first I wanna say, we can partially check this. If you only go up to six boxes, so the six boundary point diagrams, you get a well-defined action of everything. So I get a well-defined large dimensional, I forget the number, dimensional representation of the annular braid group on six strands, that's no problem. And not only has that, I have a well-defined action of H's on that. Like I can put a, you know, like a, an, an H on two of the strands and I have a well-defined action of that that's compatible with all of my relations. I can, take six boundary point diagrams and do that and get a well-defined five boundary point diagram and just all of that is well-defined up to six boxes but we can't go past six boxes it might not be well-defined but we can calculate a two variable not polynomial for all prime knots up to 12 crossings so the important thing is if you can break up your knot as gluing together six boxes three at a time like you take a six boundary point thing, you glue it to another six boundary point thing along three of them, you glue that to another six boundary point thing along three of them until you get to your knot. If you can do that, um, then you can calculate our thing because we know what it does up to six boxes. Under, it's only well-defined up to like moves only going through you know, so so the, the, this is like Conway girth six is what we call this. So it's like if your knot has Conway girth six, you get an answer, but it might not, it might only be well defined up to isotopies that 
only go through Conway Girth 6 diagrams. Um, okay, so might not be as well defined, but we can calculate it. I wrote a polynomial here. At first glance, it should only be rational functions. If you make the right change of variables, the right change of variables is mysterious. It's a typical like Scott trial and error thing. Like we have no idea where it comes from. It's just like you get a thousand knots and then you're like, what can I, what do the denominators look like? And then you clear the denominators and okay. So, but up to 12 crossings, you get, uh, you get, uh, you get a Laurent polynomial with integer coefficients in V and W. Okay, so if you want to go and now do uh, a, a three variable not homology for the quantum exceptional series, this is the ultimate chaos my point of view is the like classical series doesn't exist, but not only does the quantum one exist, there's a Kavana homology for it, right? That's that would be ridiculous, but uh, you know, we have no evidence of this, but they really are polynomials in a good sense. Um, and as an application, we can calculate the E8 knot polynomial for all prime knots up to, oh, this should say 12. Uh, we can do links up to 11 and knots up to 12. And this is unconditional because we know that the E8 knot invariant exists and satisfies all these relations. So whatever calculation we did here, we can actually do this. And this is actually the state of the art for computing E8 knot polynomials. No, like the state. The state of the art before was bad. Like you can't. Yeah, well, okay, no, no, no. There are some nice papers for torus knots. Okay, there's some nice papers for torus knots, maybe even for rational knots. But for general things, this was kind of hopeless. And now, now we can do it for all small knots. Um, yeah. So, for example, uh, this is the E8 knot polynomial for eight eighteen. Uh, it goes on for a page and a half of journal page of like actual pages. So not only does it not fit on this page, it doesn't fit on one page anyway, but there it is. Okay. Um, and then the last thing I wanted to talk about is exceptional level rank duality. So, uh, you know, in graduate school, it took me a while to come, come around to liking math papers. So for a while, there were like six math papers that I liked, and two of them were these papers by uh people at this this conference um that said sort of level rank duality comes from when two quantum groups have sort of well maybe not the same either the same or related by some some nice symmetry involving switching crossings of your skein relations so it's like if you take the quantum group you turn it into skein relations you take your other quantum group you turn it into skein relations there's just something very simple happening on the level of the skein relations okay um and this not only explains level rank duality, it makes it more precise. Often level rank duality is stated as just like the combinatorics matchup. This will actually give you a categorical statement. The reason that it's hard is that you have to change roots of unity on the same side. You can't use your favorite root of unity on both sides. If you choose your favorite root of unity on one side, you're forced to use a different root of unity around the circle on the other side. And that was, that was sort of an annoying thing. Okay, we can do the same game here. We have a two variable not polynomial. If I take two quantum groups and they happen to correspond to either the same, you know, the same scheme relations, and there are some nice symmetries. Like if I change V to minus V and double, you know, there's some nice symmetries that are in the paper that won't actually change your scheme relations, you'll get the same answer assuming our conjectures. So anytime you have an object in any quantum group that breaks up like this, you have to have our relations. And so if you assume our, our things are, are true, you should get a bunch of sort of exceptional level rank dualities. And you could go and try to prove these even without our conjectures. So here's a picture of all the level rank dualities. These are the actual E8 families, or these lines like this. So like this line is the adjoint representation of E8, corresponds to those variables in V and W. F4 is like one of these lines over here, F4 with its defining representation is one of these lines over here, and F4 with its adjoint representation is this line here. And any time two of those lines intersect, you get a level rank duality, conjecturally. Now, you, you might be a little careful, because remember, you have to be careful about the group, like it might involve like a, a, a little equivariantization or looking at the only the root vectors or this kind of a thing, but every single one of these intersections should give here. Um, this assumes our conjectures, uh, the circled one here 
is very special. Unfortunately, I can't tell you about it, but it's F4 at level four, and it is probably related to the extended hot ref subfactor. So it's very exciting that this might be explained by this little intersection point there. Uh, I was jealous of two things during the talks this week. One was Andrew's animals, and he told me in no uncertain terms that I could not put an animal in my slide, but I've, I've worn one of my favorite bird t-shirts instead. And Theo had a very large table, and I was like, why don't I have a large table in my talk? So this is this is the list of intersection points on this thing. And uh, right here is the one that, where did the, where did the F4 level four? I don't know where it went, um, but uh, it's not. F4, F4. Oh, anyway, this is the big table. Yeah, that's right. Um, and uh, yeah, so that's it. I will stop here. And okay, thank you for a very nice talk. Anybody have questions? Need the microphone? So uh, you wrote that uh, maybe quantum does not imply uh, classical. Yeah. So there is this theory of a finite type invariant. Yeah, exactly. So if you start with uh, this theory on uh, hypothetical quantum uh, yeah. thing, uh, you will not get. Uh... Right. So that's what I was saying that you get a version of the implication in the other direction. So if you assume the classical one, you can use a Kinsevich integral type argument that tells you that finite type okay. knots exist to get the to get the quantum one. Yeah, yeah. But in the other direction, you have also weight system. We get you're getting some weight uh, system. Uh, yeah, um, yeah. I mean, in fact, I would really like to understand what goes wrong as you come into the F four one. But what what can happen is that somehow you get what's going to happen potentially bad. What's going to happen is that some diagram, you're going to be able to simplify in two different ways to get different numbers, and that's going to kill your whole category. And the issue is that if at some point you use genuinely that the overcrossing is exactly equal to the undercrossing in one of your simplifications, in a way that when I break that, it becomes more complicated, and the, and the extra terms magic, you know, that, that's sort of the, the thing that could go wrong, uh, is that is that you just get the zero category as you degenerate. That's that's what I'm worried about. But yeah, no, that's an interesting question if you just try to expand that. No, it's a good question to try to go the other way. Dylan is sort of the expert on that part of it, so I will probably have to ask so him. you get yeah. a, a bunch of, of yeah. on the graded uh, space corresponding yeah. to a finite tab? Uh, that's right. Yeah. That's right. You should get something like that. No, that's a great question. I don't know the answer. Um. So in the in the for the quantum group, uh, you have this uh, forgetful quantum, which is a tensor quantum to weight space, right? I mean, restricted to the torus. Um, in these categories that you have, is there also some tensor quantum to a, the torus with an object with dimension t and some yeah. field grading? It's a good question. Um, I don't have an answer to that, but we do have in the paper like a bunch of like uh, things that kind of look like they should be the weight diagrams of the representation. So if you look at sort of the dimensions of the objects up to the, we could only go up to the third tensor power, but up to the third tensor power, we know how everything decomposes and we know it's quantum dimension. And you can like look at what those quantum dimensions are and those should be like characters. And so, uh, I, of course, like restricting to the torus, that's like asking about the characters. So uh, they're, there maybe is something there, you know, it, 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 I mean, the kind of question that, I, you know, it's like, what is the stable, what's like the GLT version, even for GLT and OT, I'm not sure I know the answer to your question, but like, what is the GLT version of uh, the vial character formula? I don't quite know, maybe the people who are more experts on GLT do, but I feel like that's of the same flavor as what you're asking. So I'm asking because from my perspective, those are, of course, real categories which have dimensions which are not integral and so on. Yeah, yeah. Um, but the same problem already, or problems or features you already have in this, in this Carton level, and then maybe you have some chance of one thing that in this category you can try to reconstruct yeah, the, yeah. the rest of the quantum group. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you, you told us that, like, Kind of one of the defining characteristics of this exceptional series, which I, I guess is to to lean's, I think it was an observation of Tulin's, is that sort of the adjoint breaks up in such and such way. So the square of the adjoint. Exactly. Breaks. Yeah. Yeah. Um, do the other like, do, do the other series have a similar kind of just description for? Yeah, but not like, with respect to the. Well, okay. Yeah. yeah. The adjoint. Well, okay. There's there's two different things you 
might want to do. Some of the other series are more natural to define with respect to other representations. Right. I think they do also have rep uh, uh, right. You could talk about like the SLN with its adjoint representation. It should be generated by like two trivalent vertices. The better thing is you take that semi-direct Z2 and then you, yeah, I think all of those, yeah, they have some coherent way that, I mean, it's not just how the adjoint squared breaks up. Any representation breaks up in a predictable way in the OSP series or the GLT series. Uh, I know less about the ones coming from supergroups. Uh, they're a little weird. Yeah. yeah. So is it the case that the braid group image generates all of the endomorphisms? Uh, I don't remember whether we ever checked. I mean, that's something that in principle we could check up to up to six. We'd have no idea past that. I cannot remember because it's been like five years since we were doing those kinds of calculations. It's definitely not in the paper. And we have, so the, where they came from is like mysterious, complicated code that is lost for all time now. Uh, but uh, we do have the matrices explicitly. So if you, you know, if you just want to look up, so well, the reason this is not yet on the archive is I have to clean this up. But once it's on the archive, there will just be, here's all the matrices for how crossings act. And so you could, in principle, try to check that. Um, and so, yeah, but I don't know off the top of my head. Probably it does, but okay. yeah. yeah. Yeah, it seems like that. I mean, because that's sort of why you take the vector representation and not the spin. Yeah, 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 yeah. I, I would imagine it does, but I don't, I don't know. There are no more questions. Let's thank Mila.